Back in the North Sea, the drilling crew of the mega oil rig, the Noble Pete, has reached a depth of more than 3,000 meters below the sea floor. But now, something's going wrong. They've only drilled 24 meters in the last 12 hours. That's 150 meters less than they'd expected. They must have hit some kind of snag. But the instruments aren't showing any problems. The pressure in the well is stable, and the drill bit's rotation is constant. So they have to look elsewhere for an explanation. The first things they check are bits of drilled rock coming up from the well. Examining them shows what type of rock layer the drill is grinding through at this moment. Seeing hard rock, like granite or marble, would explain the slow progress. But under close inspection, Tom Brangis only sees salt. The drill should be grinding through the salt eight times faster than it's going. Clearly, the problem is not in the material they're drilling through. This could be bad news. Drilling chief Tony Wilpshaw wonders if the problem could be an undrillable well. But sometimes you have these wells, they, they don't want to be drilled. Sometimes the problems are so big, they can't be solved, and then it's not economically worth to do it, you know, that the profit afterwards will be nothing. If this well proves undrillable, they will have wasted 40 days and over $2 million. Tony knows that the only way to find the problem is to haul out and check all 3,000 meters of drill pipe. This is the worst part of a roughneck's job. The pipe must be pulled up and each 30-meter section detached and stored in a corner of the drill floor. It's grueling, messy work. The drilling mud is everywhere. And one at a time, over 300 heavy pipe segments must come out of the sea. The job is just too big for the roughnecks to handle by themselves. That's why Carl Gregg is perched 45 meters up in the derrick. Okay. He's using a robotic arm to grasp the top of each pipe and place it safely in a rack. But coordinating the move of a 30-meter pipe is risky, especially when the men grappling with the bottom end look like ants. Carl can't even see these men directly. He's totally dependent on a video monitor and hand signals. Even with this communication, it's a dangerous lift. If Carl opens these pincers too early, the pipe could fall on an unsuspecting worker. It takes eight hours to remove all the pipes from the hole. A massive effort that will be a total waste if Tony's inspection fails to reveal the problem. But when the last pipe finally emerges, it's immediately clear what's been slowing their progress. A mangled drill bit. Inspection reveals that several of the diamond tip points broke off during drilling. Spinning loose inside the well, these ultra-hard diamond tips ground into the drill bit, causing extensive damage. A lot of cutters are lost, you know, here, 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 there, all these cutters being lost. The roughnecks grab another drill bit, one they hope will hold up, and attach it to the first pipe. Now they send the new bit back down into the hole, reconnecting all 300 pipes, one by one. It will take another eight hours before the drill reaches the bottom. This should get the drilling moving forward again, but they've lost precious time. It's been an exhausting day for assistant driller Paul Brehavus. When things aren't going well on the drill floor, roughnecks end up working twice as hard, and Paul spent eight of the last 12 hours hauling out drill pipe. But at last, his shift is over. If you work 12 hours and sleep eight, there's not much time left over for anything else. And if you're sweaty and grimy, your life's on hold till you get cleaned up. When you're as tired as Paul, an oil rig can seem like the world's biggest stairmaster.
Here's my apartment. Like almost everyone on board, Paul shares a cramped cabin. But cabin mates rarely see each other. Paul works the day shift, his cabin mate works nights. Thank you. At mealtimes, people often don't have energy to talk. But at least the food's not bad. After dinner, the roughnecks try as best they can to unwind. But here, it's tough to forget about the job. Inside, it's claustrophobic. Everywhere you go, there's a reminder that you're still at work. Even out on deck, a homesick roughneck can only stare at the ocean and hope that the time passes quickly. So workers relax as best they can. Hitting the gym. Hanging out with friends. Even watching a G-rated kids movie. Over time, the workers become like family. And like most families, there's only so much togetherness they can take. After two weeks, we are very glad we don't see each other for two weeks anymore. <laughs> but there's a payoff. These two weeks of grueling work allow them to have two weeks of uninterrupted home time. I see my children uh, go to school and that sort of things. And that's important for me. Not just weekends, huh? Mm. It's I'm two weeks off, but then I'm, after that I'm two weeks full-time daddy. And that's very nice. For the workers, it's a constant trade-off between great rewards and great risk. After all, three spindly legs are the only thing protecting them from the frigid waters of the North Sea. On an oil rig, nothing is as important as the legs. The rig Alexander Keeland proved that when it collapsed in a North Sea storm in 1980. 123 workers died. The cause? A cracked leg. A single faulty part of a leg can lead to disaster. But it's a huge challenge to design and construct a leg that's tough enough to take extreme weather conditions. That's the problem facing the engineers at the Singapore shipyard. Senior engineer Chia Meng Kyung is testing his leg design for a new harsh environment rig. He batters the leg with violent virtual storms. As forces on the legs increase and decrease, the image changes color. Red indicates the strongest stresses. When he analyzes exactly where the stresses are worst, he will redesign that part of the leg to strengthen it. This newly built leg section stands ready to be transported to its oil rig, which has just been undocked. It towers 34 meters high and weighs as much as 35 bull elephants. How do they move a structure this tall and this heavy to the rig? None of the shipyard cranes can handle the job, so they call in Hercules. 